Hello, good day everybody. Welcome to our next episode of Dissection, some surgical dissection. My name is Dr. Sanjay Sanyal. I'm a professor and I'm a surgeon by profession. I'm also a neuroscientist. This time we have chosen the popliteal fossa. And we'll mention a few surgical aspects about the popliteal fossa also. So let's first give a quick overview of the anatomy of the popliteal fossa. As all of you know, this is a quadrangular space on the back of the knee. Therefore, it has got a supralateral and a supramedial boundary, infralateral, inframedial boundary. This is a prone cadaver, and the left leg of the cadaver is being seen here. This is the upper end of the cadaver, this is the lower of the foot end, this is the lateral aspect, this is the medial side. The cadaver is prone, and this is the left side. The supralateral boundary is formed by the biceps femoris tendon. The supramedial boundary is formed by the semimembranosus muscle, and it is overlapped by the semitendinosus tendon. By the way, you can see the semitendinosus tendon is getting inserted onto the medial aspect of the tibia, along with the other gracilis and the sartorius, which forms what is known as the pesacerinus. Okay, let's come back. This is the infralateral boundary, and that is formed by the medial head of the lateral head of the gastrocnemius, and this is the inframedial boundary, which is formed by the medial head of the gastrocnemius. And therefore, this small quadrangular space is the popliteal fossa. These are the boundaries. What about the flow of the popliteal fossa? For ease of understanding, I have divided into three parts. The upper part is the femoral part, the middle portion is the capsule of the knee joint, and the lower part is the tibial part. So the posterior aspect of the femur is the upper part of the floor, the posterior aspect of the capsule of the knee joint is the middle part of the floor, and a little bit of the popliteus fascia and the popliteus muscle forms the lower part of the floor. Now please note that point because I'm going to come back to it again a little later. What about the roof of the popliteal fossa? The roof of the popliteal fossa is formed by a tough fascia called the popliteal fascia. The popliteal fascia is actually an extension of the fascia of the thigh above and it continues down into the fascia cruris of the leg below. This is a tough fascia and that has got a clinical significance which I shall mention in the next slide. Coming to the contents of the popliteal fossa, apart from the usual contents, fat and lymph nodes, the three most content, important contents are visible here. Here you can see the popliteal artery. The popliteal artery is the deepest structure. In other words, if you see from the popliteal side, it is the deepest. That means it is the most interior. Then you have the popliteal vein. And we ideally, we are supposed to see the tibial nerve, which goes from one apex and exits through the other apex of the popliteal quadrangle. However, in this particular specimen, the sciatic nerve is dividing low. And normally, the sciatic nerve divides at the junction between the upper two thirds and the lower one third of the thigh up above. But here it is dividing low, so therefore the sciatic nerve is entering into the popliteal fossa. And here in the popliteal fossa, it is dividing into the common fibular nerve and the tibial nerve. So the tibial nerve is ideally the content of the popliteal fossa. And that also I mentioned in my clinical correlations. Uh, so we have seen the important contents. And finally, the short saphenous vein which runs on the back of the leg, it pierces through the popliteal fascia between the two heads of the gastrocnemius and therefore that and terminates on the popliteal vein. So the termination of the short saphenous vein is also a content of the popliteal fossa. Now let's see a few important clinical correlations. The most basic being palpation of the popliteal artery. We'll mention three, three aspects of it. First, the position of the patient, the location of the palpation, and what should be the position of the leg. I've seen mentions in the literature where the patient is being palpated with the patient in the supine position or the well, that is not exactly advised. I would prefer that you put the patient, if the patient is in a position to be moved, the patient should be in a prone position because that is the only way we can dip our fingers deeply inside. Where exactly do we palpate? Now, I told you the popliteal artery is rather deeply located. Therefore, the finger has to be dipped in very deep. And it cannot be possibly be palpated as such also the popliteal artery is very difficult to palpate. And on top of that, it is not possible to palpate it on the posterior surface of the knee, on the posterior surface of the femur. So ideally, it should be palpated when it is in relation to the tibia or in relation to the popliteus muscle, which means it is, should be palpated at the lower end of the popliteal fossa. And then comes the important part, what should be the position of the leg? The leg should be flexed because I told you there's a tough fascia here called the popliteal fascia. And as long as the popliteal fascia is stretched, it is impossible to dip our fingers deep inside as it's required. Another important reason is when the leg is extended, the semimembranosus tendon, it comes more laterally and it covers part of the popliteal fossa. And therefore, it becomes even more difficult to palpate the popliteal artery. For these two very good reasons, the leg should be flexed. And then we should dip our finger deep inside between the two heads of the gastrocnemius in relation to the tibia. And we should try to feel the popliteal artery in 
on the posterior aspect of the tibia. When do we feel for the popliteal pulse? Usually it's quite difficult to feel it as I told you earlier and we try to do it not to diagnose a peripheral, this thing, a peripheral circulatory failure or shock syndrome because for that we have the carotid artery. Here we do it when we are suspecting a peripheral vascular disease of the lower limb and that is the time and even if we don't feel it we can still try to feel the, distal, uh, the dorsalis pedis or the posterior tibial artery which will also be an indirect evidence that the popliteal circulation is intact. So that is about the palpation of the popliteal artery. Now let's take another aspect of this popliteal artery and that is known as the popliteal artery entrapment syndrome. Now the popliteal artery as I told you is rather deeply located in the popliteal fossa and there have been numerous mentions in the literature though it's quite a rare condition. As the term implies it is the popliteal artery getting entrapped by certain structures inside the popliteal fossa. Now there are several classifications. The simplest classification is that of the Heidelberg classification which states that the type 1, 2 and 3. Type 1 of the Heidelberg classification states that there is an abnormal course of the popliteal artery. Type 2, an abnormal attachment of the muscle in the popliteal fossa. And type 3, when there is a combination of both. But to go a little deeper, the love and valent classification is the one which is more detailed and that describes it into six types. Type 1 is when the popliteal artery is a little more medial than its normal location and therefore it gets entrapped by the medial head of the gastrocnemius that is type 1. In type 2 the medial head of the gastrocnemius is migrated more laterally and therefore it traps the popliteal artery. In type 3 there is an additional slip of the muscle of the gastrocnemius which entraps the popliteal artery. In type 4 when the popliteal artery is entrapped by either a fibrous band or by the popliteus muscle, though it's a little difficult to understand how the popliteus muscle may be involved because normally the popliteal artery runs on the surface of the popliteus muscle. Then we have type 5 where apart from any one of those above previous features, if the popliteal vein is also included in the entrapment, then it is called type 5. And finally, we have a type 6 which has been added rather recently. That is when what is known as the functional entrapment syndrome where both the popliteal artery and the muscles are normal. However, the patient has functional symptoms suggestive of entrapment due to hypertrophied muscles and that has been described as the functional type or type 6 of PAES. That brings me to the demographics. In which type of population does it see? As I told you, it's rather rare and most of the reports in the literature are case reports. Obviously, these abnormalities, anatomical abnormalities are congenital. However, they manifest themselves only in certain groups of people and they're usually seen in young muscular males or athletic males, those who play, those who have sports and young soldiers. It is being increasingly recognized by the military surgeons. So there, the abnormality, underlying abnormality does exist and on top of that, uh, the muscles get hypertrophied and they compress the popliteal artery and therefore they're present with all the features of claudication and it has been recognized as one of the causes of claudication in a young muscular male without any features of atherosclerosis. And as like any other compression, it can also produce a post dilatation, it can produce post aneurysm, thrombosis, embolism, and all other complications. Mm -hmm. And when it is symptomatic, the only treatment is surgical. If the fibrous bands or the muscle can be repositioned, or the artery can be repositioned, then it should be done. Otherwise, Piperas grafting is the only answer. So that is about the popliteal artery entrapment syndrome in brief. Now let's take a look at another aspect. Because the popliteal artery is located in relation to the femur and in relation to the tibia, any major fracture of the femur or the tibia can injure the popliteal artery and then can be severe hemorrhage. Or even if it's a minor injury, they can be because of the close proximity between the popliteal artery and the popliteal vein, there can be an arteriovenous fistula. And as I told you, it can also be the subject of aneurysm, like one of, one of them being the popliteal artery entrapment syndrome, or it can also be an aneurysm due to any other causes. If there's a hemorrhage of the popliteal artery, and we have to ligate it, we need to ligate the femoral artery after it is given off the profunda femoris. Well, we can ligate it because there's a very rich anastomosis, which is known as the genicular anastomosis given off by the popliteal artery branches, five of them and a few contributions from the femoral artery and the tibial arteries. So therefore, in such cases, we can ligate the femoral artery. What about the aneurysm? If it's a very big aneurysm, then again, 
uh, bypass grafting is the only answer. Or if it's an arteriovenous fistula, then also we have to bypass and graft it. We must also remember another thing. The popliteal artery also gives plenty of muscular branches. The popliteal artery gives plenty of muscular branches, which has got a very rich and very clinically important uh, anastomosis with the branches of the profunda femoris artery and also with branches of the gluteal artery. So therefore, they do provide collateral circulation. So that is about a few words about the aneurysm, arteriovenous fistula and hemorrhage and what is the thing to be done. And finally, let's take a look at this condition which is referred to as the popliteal cyst, also called the Baker cyst or the Moran Baker cyst, named after the person who described it first. Here the underlying condition is something totally different compared to what we have discussed earlier. Here the person is suffering from chronic synovitis and chronic knee joint effusion and there is always an underlying component of osteoarthritis of the knee joint. As we know, the gastrocnemius muscle has got a bursa in relation to it, just at, under its attachment. Similarly, the semimembranosus muscle also has got a bursa between its insertion and the attachment of the gastrocnemius. The, this bursa, the gastrocnemius bursa, communicates with the knee joint caps, okay, and the cavity, the synovial cavity of the knee joint. Similarly, the popliteus muscle also has got a bursa under it, which also communicates with the knee joint. And apart from that, we know the knee joint has got many bursa all around it. The most common cause of popliteal cyst is when the bursa from this bursts through the capsule of the knee joint from the gastrocnemius and it presents as a swelling on the back of the knee. That forms a popliteal cyst. The same thing can happen when the semimembranosus bursa also bursts through the capsule of the knee joint and it presents as a swelling. Or the other possibility is when any of the periarticular bursa around the knee they release the synovial fluid and they all collect in the knee joint and form a separate swelling and that forms a popliteal cyst. Now, no matter what the swelling is, whether it's a popliteal cyst or whether it's an aneurysm or anything, we must remember one very important aspect and that is the popliteal space is a very limited space. And whenever there is any, any space occupying lesion, as we call it, the structure which is most liable to compression is the tibial nerve. And the tibial nerve can get directly compressed, whether it's by an aneurysm or whether it's by an enlarged lymph node or whether it is by a bursa. Or, and it can either be directly compressed or the vasa nervosa of the tibial nerve can be compromised. And then the patient will present with all the features of tibial neuropathy and paralysis and weakness of the muscles supplied by the tibial nerve on the back of the leg and the foot. How do we differentiate an aneurysm from a lymph node swelling? An aneurysm will present with an expansile pulsation on the back of the knee and a lymph node swelling which is situated on top of the popliteal will have a transmitted pulsation. Additionally, if there's a person has got an arteriovenous fistula, then we will be able to feel a palpable thrill when we palpate and we will be able to hear a continuous machinery murmur, so-called bruit in the case of arteriovenous fistula. So these are a few words, quick words about the clinical correlation surgical aspects of the popliteal region. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for watching. If you have any questions or comments, please put them in the comment section below. Have a nice day.